a lot of people didn't really see that sneakers were the future in the early 90s and 80s. Because Anita believes that sneakers have the power to rapidly establish new mindsets and trends. This is Blair Durham with Black Wall Street Today, your media hub for all things black entrepreneurship, politics, news, and events in Hampton Roads and beyond. And now, here's your host, Blair Durham. Greetings. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's the 111th edition of Black Wall Street Today with Blair Durham. Today's show is sponsored by Milestone Mental Health Agency, Apex Financial Group of Virginia, as well as the COO team. Today our show focuses on social entrepreneurship in the age of COVID-19. Speaking of, have you downloaded our mobile app as of now, Black Brand? Uh, it is available on the Apple as well as the Android platforms, free of charge, a great way to learn about businesses. It can the roads and to stay apprised of various events uh, that our organization is hosting. If not, are you following us on Facebook at Black Brand Biz? Plug in there again for the latest networking and business education events as well. So according to Wikipedia, social entrepreneurship is an approach by individuals, groups, startup companies, or entrepreneurs in which they develop, fund, and implement solutions to social, cultural, or environmental issues. Now, that distinguishes it from a solely for-profit business model, and that's why I'm excited to chat with our very first guest today. Uh, we're going to talk now with Anita Lumpkin. She is the founder and CEO of Something for the Culture. As a native of Hampton Roads, Anita's concern for the rapid rates of the rising Atlantic Ocean due to human-induced climate change gave way to a unique business idea as an approach to saving her beloved community. Something for the Culture was established in 2018 to incite a positive impact on Virginia's sneaker community through the creation of interactive educational experiences. The main goal of SSTC is to sneak ahead of climate change by shifting consumption habits. Anita's passion for SSTC is fueled by knowing that the power to win the fight against climate change lies in the hands of the consumer. Using sneakers as her weapon of choice, Anita takes pride in her unconventional way of educating others on how to reduce their consumer-related carbon footprint because Anita believes that sneakers have the power to rapidly establish new mindsets and trends. Something for the Culture is the parent company for Anita's newest Endeavor, sneakers a la carte, birthed as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sneakers a la carte is a fully sustainable, contactless, mobile sneaker store specializing in the resale of popular streetwear, sneakers, and accessories. Anita has partnered with Something in the Water on the issues of climate change and is currently developing an after-school program called Sneaker Hunters Club at Richard Bowling Elementary School in Norfolk to create a sneaker garden to educate youth who are on the future, or who are rather, the future of our community. Anita has earned an Associate of Art and Science. She's Six Sigma certified, and she's currently finishing up a Bachelor's in Merchandise Management. Welcome to the show, Anita. How are you? Thank you so much, Blair. I'm doing well with yourself. I am doing awesome. So excited to learn about these efforts. Um, and thank you so much for really the creative way in which you are addressing climate change. It's my pleasure. Um, my mother challenged me to find what my niche was and my passion and then find a way to make social change with using that passion. And that's kind of what I was able to do. Yeah. I'm excited to have this conversation because um, man, I never got into sneakers the way that I wanted to. You know, you talk about your parents. Um, my mother just wasn't really going to develop a budget <laughs> for me to have the sneaker collection that I really wanted. And as a result, really as an adult, I didn't embrace it. So I'd love it if you'd share with us what qualities make up a sneaker enthusiast. Um, I think the best qualities that I would say that would make up a sneaker enthusiast would be that they're loyal, very loyal to the to the brand. Um, they're also very dedicated, unconventional, open-minded. I think they're smart um, and affluential. A lot of people didn't really see that sneakers were the future in the early 90s and 80s. Um, we didn't have the foresight to know that the things that we were buying were going to be what, what they like to call in the community grails. 
uh, items that sneakers that are unwearable now have actual value because they are deemed as wearable art now. So I think it's the self-awareness, the artisticness, uh, the passion definitely behind it, and just the open-mindedness altogether. Those things encompass make up what truly a sneakerhead is. Okay. And then just as an aside, how did you actually get into sneakers and this, this sort of passion for sneakers before the, uh, before the kind of social component? Well, uh, like you brought up, your parents are pretty influential, and believe it or not, my mom's a big sneaker head. Uh, she wow. also tells a story <laughs> about how you, she used to get joked for wearing high tops in the 70s before sneakers were really so. Some of my earliest memories are just she would teach me how to wash my laces, keep my shoes clean. Um, I remember begging my mom for a pair of, back then in the 80s, it was crazy to buy a pair of shoes for $100, let alone for a child. Yeah. Um, and I begged my mother and begged my mother, begged my mother for a pair of the purple felines with the strap. Oh, I'll never boy. forget them. <laughs> I remember the and purple felines with the strap. And mind you, I'm in an elementary school, and my mom, uh, she got them for me, and the rule was I couldn't, when I, I had, she put a nail in my wall over my bed. And when I came home from school, I had to take them off, tie them up, and put them on the nail, and I wasn't allowed to play with them outside. And that kind of started my... Wow. Ability to repurpose and keep on the shoes for longer than they should normally have their life cycle. Um, it was it was pretty fun that you did on it. That's, I remember those sneakers in particular. Wow. So, okay, so let's go all the way there. Talk about this sneaker garden concept. What is it? What does it mean? Um, yeah. Okay, well... Uh, true to life full circle in elementary school I was probably the only kid wearing the type of sneakers I wore at that time frame and I know I was the first to wear the, the shoes do you remember the LA gears the first shoes that ever lit up in the back I need to the LA so the, okay so I went wow. out, I went to Suburban Park shout out to Suburban Park okay. and <laughs> I was actually um, I got in trouble I won't say trouble but it my sneakers caused such a commotion. You know how you used to have to walk down the line on the squares, like three blocks from the wall, and everybody had to, mm -hmm. It would cause such a commotion because nobody had ever seen shoes that lit up before that my teacher um, made me take them out. My mom had to get them, and then I wasn't allowed to wear them in school. So as I got older, I always that always stuck with me. And so I got an opportunity to work with an elementary school. And my whole goal was to figure out a way how, even though I was shunned for being creative in the sneaker community, how can I infuse sneakers into the education of the youth going full circle now to not only impact them in a social responsible way, but to also give them the importance of it's okay to be different. It's okay to express yourself. Um, fashion is definitely expression of not only yourself, but of your culture. And so just giving them that stepping stone to not only know that fashion is your culture, it is your identity, but it also has a purpose in the grand scheme of our um, economical growth, as well as our sustainability as a culture in general. So I decided to start with the youth on that. Okay. I I'm trying to visualize the sneaker garden, though. Did it go over my head? No, it's just simply you take a repurposed sneaker. Uh, you select a, a flower. For me, I use I, I pair it with flowers that look like the sneakers. For instance, I'll use an Air Jordan 1 that's black and blue. And then I would find a flower that encompasses those color palettes okay. and actually drill holes in the sneaker and, and plant it. And then you can literally plant it in the earth so it actually reclaims itself to the earth. And I have dozens of tennis shoes of just repurposed shoes. I find shoes. I could be driving down the highway and see a shoe on the side of the street, and I will stop and pull over and collect it to include it in my garden to keep repurposing and adding and showing beauty to the product. Wow. So, a lot of people don't know it takes about 80 years for a tennis shoe to decompose. Okay. Okay, so that's where this is going. So... Man, so this is like bigger than trash bags and bottles and straws. We're talking about a material that's not going to break down. Um, and so you're saying, since we have this passion, let's figure out how we can um, 
Hmm. How we can transition it into into something that is is viable for even longer. Right. In essence, we try to for the children. I say I put the lit in sustainability. I try to find ways mm. to create sustainable outlets without in, like taking away from your swag or your style. A lot of people shy from doing what's right because they feel it's a square thing to do or it's um, it's not cool. So I'm trying to infuse the cool with being sustainable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So where do you see this business in the next five years? Well, my business in particular or sustainability and music culture? Your particular business. So thinking about something for the culture and even sneakers a la carte, uh, what's kind of the, the trajectory? What do you hope and what are you willing to happen with the business? Well, for something for the culture, my ultimate goal has always been to expose alternative business practices and encourage ethical consumption. And I also like to showcase ecological and sustainable products. So it's to create a platform so that over the years we can create some type of hub here in Virginia. In the sneaker culture in general for Virginia, we're missing um, the big education piece. Other states and other uh, cultures within the United States and sneaker cultures, they have their big conventions. They have their big exhibits where the big sneaker companies come in and they educate and they, L.A. and New York and Miami and Atlanta, they get that attention. But Virginia is kind of the hub of the sneaker and we don't have those things. So my goal is to create those cultural experiences and events for our community so that we can congregate, we can build, we can grow, we can network, and we can, as a group, head into that right direction that we should be. Yeah. In the sneaker community, it's um, resellers, and then there's the creatives. And you can kind of go either way, and I'm trying to push the narrative of the creative. You know, I know a number of sneakerheads, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I can understand why you're saying that Virginia is sort of the hub um, for for sneaker activity. But I'd love it if you would elaborate on that. I mean, is there is there a research component that's involved? What 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 led you to the conclusion that that VA is is this hub that you speak of? Well, a lot of the most current influential designers and sneaker enthusiasts come straight out of Virginia. Uh, one of the really? most popular... Oh, yes. Well, we already know we're rich and diverse in just artistry. That's a given. Uh, there's a guy named John Witherspoon. Okay. He created one of the most iconic sneakers to date, right out of Richmond. Okay. He's so big that he has shops in Richmond, California, Miami. I mean, this guy's everywhere. He's literally single-handedly transitioned the sneaker game. And believe it or not, his platform is sustainability as well. And these shoes that he made were out of sustainable material. And it just straight shattered the ceiling in the sneaker community. Uh, right out of Richmond, local guy. Really nice guy. Um, we all know Pharrell and Pharrell's just influential on everything, but his sneaker line as well kind of pivoted. It was a change. Um, and then we have a lot of influential sneaker shops here as far as meat supply, which unfortunately due to the pandemic, they closed down. Um, we had, of course, like I said, round two, we have some the Commonwealth here locally in the 757. And in the sneaker community and with sneaker stores, no matter where you live, uh, sneakers work on accounts. And so depending on the account of the type of account your sneaker local sneaker store have, it dictates the type of shoes you have access to. Right. Well here in Virginia makes sense. Right. So here in Virginia and especially in the seven five seven in the eight oh four area, a lot of our shops have those necessary accounts where we get to actually physically walk in the store sometimes and, and purchase shoes at retail that people never get a chance to see. So that That's also makes us very unique. Right. Yeah. We get to touch things that people all over the country sometimes don't even get a chance to see. Yeah. The first thing that kind of came to my mind was the relationship between um, sneakers and poverty, right? You think about the concentration of poverty, say, in Portsmouth and Norfolk. 
um, and just wondering, you know, what that relationship really is. Um, I know that Norfolk has some interesting statistics as it relates to wealth as well. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just, just thinking through that, you know, culturally and, and socially, um, you know, the, the prioritization of certain values and so forth. Very interesting what you have what well, you have happened upon here. Go ahead. Well, that is another part of the stigma that I try to educate and break. Um, sneakers have been officially designated as a tradable commodity. It no longer has this, the stigma of you're wasting your money. That's why I also try to teach uh, conservation and preservation of the shoes. Believe it or not, the sneaker community is one of the very few re- uh, communities that have created a resale market where you can buy a pair of shoes and wear them and then sell them for more that you paid for them. So in this community and the way things are going now, what I'm trying to instill in the children, I'm trying to get people to understand um, when you make your sneaker choices, not only make them off of your preferences, but also it's almost like a stock and market. Mm-hmm. You have to know which shoes when you do buy them. Okay, if I buy the shoe, I can wear them a couple times, and then I can sell them and make more money. I had a cousin, young, fresh out of high school. There was a shoe that was released right here locally. The shoe cost maybe $190. Okay. As soon as he purchased the shoe and it touched it, it immediately was worth $1,200 instantly. It's as soon as it releases and you have it. So at that point in time, he had a choice of whether selling it, receiving that value for the shoe, holding on to it because it is a commodity. The same shoe that we're talking about that released two years ago is now worth $2,400. It has doubled in profit in just a year. By just holding on to it, it's done nothing. Or he could wear it and then sell it eventually. Him being a kid, he wore it. He still sold the shoes for $600. Fantastic. The so look, I mean, that angle. We've got about three minutes remaining. I had another kind of thought that popped in my head uh, as I'm kind of staring out the window here. I've seen and I know of uh, I know of a, a I wouldn't call it a tradition, but um, this piece about throwing sneakers over the power line. <laughs> yeah. You ever driven through a neighborhood and seen sneakers kind of on on display, quote unquote, in that regard? Not only that, but as I said, over time, sneakers have the sneakers that we had in the eighties and the nineties are now worth a lot of money. I've wanted and wished that I could get some of them down. Yeah. Because they don't even realize how valuable those shoes that they've hung up there are worth now. And then the ex, uh, I used to work for the electric company, so then the, that side of me kind of like shivers. So I'm like, oh, I thought the electric line. So <laughs> I have a dual part on that one. Interesting. So we've got about a few minutes. How can, how can folks connect to your work, to your mission, to your sneakers? What's kind of the timeline? I know that sneakers a la carte is uh, in, in launch mode. What, talk, talk us through that part real quick. Well, what I've done, sneakers a la carte, was a miniaturized version of the experiences that I was trying to provide in my event. Mm-hmm. So I was able to put it on a mobile aspect. Okay. We're looking to launch at the end of January, and we're looking to be at local events, sporting events, major music festivals. We're looking to be stationed up in high traffic areas, as well as if and when the pandemic does arise again and we have to shut down, we'll be able to do delivery service. That way, uh, for us, as far as COVID-19 was concerned in the sneaker community, it was impacted very hard, not only with COVID-19, but with the riots. So a lot of our big favorite stores had to shut down. So there's a a big gap right now in just creating that space between brick and mortar and online service. And I feel that Sneakers a la carte will fill that void. Smart. I absolutely love it. So give us a website, contact details. Uh, you can go to www.somethingfortheculture just for general information. You can go to www.sneakercart.com for our upcoming uh, endeavors. You can follow us on Instagram at sneakercart, C-A-R-T-E. Um, and you can always just reach out to me. I can be found on Facebook under image, I-M-A-G-E, Lumpkin, L-U-M-P-K-I-N. 
Or if you want to email me, it's simply Anita, A-N-I-T-A dot Lumpkin, L-U-M-P-K-I-N at somethingfortheculture.com. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm so excited <laughs> and I look forward to really, you know, continuing this dialogue um, as everything kind of progresses with the work that you're doing. Uh, congrats to you on, on the local partnerships with schools and things. Uh, really excited about your efforts. Thank you so much, Bo, and thank you for creating this platform for us here in 757. It's really needed. And it's very refreshing. Awesome. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Talk soon. Talk soon. Talk soon. Talk soon. This show is brought to you by Positive Vibes Incorporated, our consulting services. We do credit fixes, tax resolution, we lend private money to real estate investors, and we do debt consolidations. Basically, we put money in your pocket. When you need money, we put money in your pocket when you need money. 757-932-0177. Stay with us online at Black Wall Street Today on Facebook and Black Wall Street Today on Instagram. And then follow us on Twitter as well at BWS Today. We look forward to talking again next week. Have a wonderful week. I have said and I will continue to say that the most important priority for the black community is the black community, not a particular political party. Hey, yo, when I say black, you say Wall Street. Black, black Wall Street. When I say black, you say Wall Street. Black, black. When I say black, you say Wall Street. Black, black. When I say black, you say Wall Street. Black, black. Black Wall Street, Black Wall Street. Phenomenal.